Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome back to um, Waikiki and uh, pup date number three for Rocky and her pup. Um, I am Dr. Charles Littman from NOAA's Hawaiian Medical Research Program, and this is my co-host. Eliza millett Winfrey from our regional office. And so we're just going to give you, again, our usual update and hopefully um, be here to answer some questions live. And hopefully you guys can hear us. We were having a little bit of a sound problem. So if you can hear me, say yes, you can. And if you can't, then you're probably complaining by now. So, um, so first, real quick, um, update behind us. Hopefully you can see. Um, we've got Phoebe, a six-year-old female who has just recently um, completed her molt sphere. Um, and then just off to the right is Rocky and her pup. Um, just three weeks old now, and everything looks great. Um, Mom is still in, in pretty darn good condition, and the pup is much fatter. Um, we won't have an exact weight, um, but you know, you kind of think that they're probably gaining, on average, maybe um, a pound to two pounds a day. So it could be by now into the 60 pound range, uh, probably a little bit more than that on their way to being Are we good now? Is that better? <laughs> that's, that's good. We're good? Okay. Um, so did they hear any of it? Yeah, yeah they heard you. It was just that. It, it was just soft. Oh, okay. Um, so anyway, um, pup three weeks old, probably getting to 60 pounds a little bit more, and uh, every, everything is going great. Um, the real emphasis uh, this week, again, has been um, ocean safety, human safety, and, and, and trying to manage that situation. Again, overall, people have been great, but we want Mama Bear Eliza oh, to uh, maybe drive home a little bit more um, to get across the, the importance of being really savvy around these animals if you're going to be in the water. So, Eliza, what have you been telling the public this week about care and safety around mom and pup? Well, I think that one of the, the biggest things that I'm trying to get across is uh, folks that are really comfortable in the water and are out here using uh, this area every single day and are really accustomed to being around these animals and doing laps out at Kaimanas, um, have an understanding of the animals for the most part because they're really used to seeing monk seals, but this is a different animal. This is a mama monk seal. This is not your typical slow-moving, sleepy monk seal. This is a mom who's going to actively protect her pup from what she perceives as a threat, and anyone who's in the water could be perceived as a threat at any moment. Um, moreover, mom and pup are moving around a lot. They've moved from Kaimanas to Queens. They've gone all the way past the Elks. They have been seen out at the Windsock where folks are swimming to every single day. And so we're just really concerned that they're going to pop up without you realizing it, even though you're being incredibly vigilant and an attack will occur. So we're, we're all kind of holding our breath right now. And we'd, we'd love it if folks followed DLNR's suggestion and, and urging folks to, to use different beaches right now. Yeah, so um, as we've watched um, the newscasts that, you know, as they've been posted online and, and following people's comments, I, one of the events they showed from earlier was um, Ki'ivi behind us approaching um, the beach with um, Rocky and her pup uh, swimming nearby. And uh, Rocky was completely calm, doing her thing with her pup. Um, looked over to the left, saw Kiwi approaching, and immediately went from that slow-moving, docile, adorable thing to a torpedo. Um, and it's a really quite violent attack. Um, some people have referred to it as playing. It's not playing at all. Um, Rocky didn't care if it was a female seal, a male seal, or potentially a shark. It was a dark object in the water, which was a potential threat to her pup. So people snorkeling, people swimming laps, um, there's a very good chance that um, Rocky is not going to differentiate you from any of those other threats and could act accordingly. So um, people have also said, but she's been so calm um, and she doesn't seem really affected by people. So she seems nice. Um, she is a wild animal. Um, we have seen this sort of stuff before where you have an animal that's behaving one way for days and days and days. And suddenly, for whatever reason, um, inexplicable to us, um, they can become more aggressive or that behavior can change dramatically. So. 
um, just don't become complacent. And extrapolating this to the wider population and, and moms and pups elsewhere, we may find that um, Rocky is docile and that she isn't bothered by people and she never aggressively goes after someone. The next mother and pup pair might not be that way. So whatever you see here and experience here, the next time you're around in a mom and pup, still respect the distance and do not think that they're going to be anything like Rocky. So we, again, we just don't want complacency. Love and respect them, um, but just keep your distance. I wanted to add just to that a little bit, talking about um, mom's general behavior being really calm around swimmers. Um, I think we've got a little bit of proof right here when you've got mom being super calm and not really caring that Kaivi is right next to her when just a few days ago, Kaivi is the one that she attacked. And days prior to that, they were also just hanging out, being calm on the beach together. And so it, it really is unpredictable when it might happen or why. So do we have any questions? So people are a little confused about there being three seals on the beach. Can we just talk about that a little bit? Sure. So again, um, so monk seals, uh, for the longest time, people have been talked about. One of the reasons they're called monk seals is because they're very solitary. Um, and compared to other seals, they are, but you do, it's not uncommon to see multiple seals kind of hauling out in the same spot. And it's generally, I think, one animal seeing that it's okay that another seal is hauled out there, that's an indication that it's probably a safe place and okay to haul out. So a situation like this is not totally unusual in the main Hawaiian Islands, but Kiibi, she's been here for, it's a couple of weeks now, a little less than a couple of weeks, um, and she's been molting. So she's the seal over on the left. Um, so she has a fresh new silver coat. Um, again, an adult female seal um, skipping pupping this year, apparently. Um, and uh, she's just doing her thing. So mom and pup are right over here. And as long as Kiwi respects the distance and keeps the minimum distance away, mom will be really happy. But there's a good chance when Kiwi starts moving down to the water or, or um, moving closer that the mom will probably wake up. She'll probably vocalize just to remind Kiwi to keep her distance and let her go on her merry way. Um, It's a great question. So uh, we're at week three, so somewhere between the next two and three weeks, um, uh, or maybe two to four weeks, um, the mom will wean and it will be very abrupt. And that pup will be very confused the first couple of days. Um, and this will be a really important time for the volunteers and the lifeguards as well to pay a lot of attention. The mother's danger will be gone, but now the pup will be looking for um, something to continue to suckle on or to interact with. And so it's very likely that that pup could be approaching anyone laying on the beach or swimming around again. So it's not quite the same physical hazard, but it is an interaction we want to avoid. And how long the seal will stick around here, the pup will stick around here, will be variable. So she could be here for two to three weeks um, and then just venture off. But we've had others that will stick around for a couple of months. And those first several weeks is that pup... Um, it's going to be massive. It's going to be, it's not the best analogy, but like a big bloated tick, right? It's going to, um, 200 pounds of solid blubber. So that's a lot of fat stores for it to live on while it tries to figure out, again, it's not being taught a lot in terms of how to feed and stuff. So it will just swim around um, looking for food, figuring out what it is to be a seal and consuming that fat. Eventually when the seal gets really curious and gets a little bit more hungry, we'll go out to see like a normal monk seal and start doing its thing. So the short answer, the pup once weaned can be here for a few weeks to a couple of months. Joy Inada asks, why are people allowed up close? That's one for you. <laughs> so monk seals are an endangered species. They're also marine mammals. They're protected under the Marine Mammal Protection Act and the Endangered Species Act. Um, we don't have laws designating how far people are allowed to um, get next to the animals. Uh, the laws are um, set up to prevent, the laws are actually to uh, ensure that nobody harasses them. And so uh, when you see folks setting up uh, a barrier around the animals, it's really uh, for us to be able to provide outreach and to help prevent people from inadvertently harassing the animals. Uh, so there's not actually a, a legal boundary around the animals. Sasha Darnell asks, are the Evie and Rocky related? I don't believe they are. Distant, distant cousins. Mm. Francine asks, will the pup know how to feed itself or feed things? 
Yeah, so the question is, will the pup uh, know how to feed itself um, or to find food? So um, we have, for some mother pup pairs, we, we've seen moms at times bring stuff to the surface and, and kind of play with it with their pup. So there might be a little bit of teaching, but by and large, it's instinctive. So we've got examples of uh, a, young, a young pup that uh, lost its mother on Ni'ihau, and we brought it in for rehabilitation. So we had it for months and months, and we fattened it up. Um, but one of the tests we had to do before we released it, because it, it had never been trained by its mother to, to do anything, was to make sure it knew how to, to feed on live fish. So we uh, released it, or we, we released live fish into the pool instantly, went after it, was very interested, and then um, once releasing it into the wild, has swum around and done well and survived. So um, we should never discount the power of instinct when it comes to wild animals. Um, Matt asks, if someone did get close and got seriously injured, what would happen to Ross? Um, so I'll, I'll start this one. It's a management question, um, and Nat has been asking this one a lot. So the question is, if somebody um, got close to Rocky um, and was injured, what would happen to Rocky? And, and I think it stems from the fear of, um, you know, if you go to some of the national parks on the mainland and, and somebody gets mauled by a bear, um, so quite often they, they will move to, to exterminate the bear. Um, until it happens, we don't know for sure, but I think it's one of the reasons why we have been so, and the state and, and Noah and everyone has been so um, explicit in the warnings to stay away and really pushed in, in the volunteers that, that have been manning the station. It's their number one education thing that they, they reach out is to keep your distance and to stay safe and the lifeguards. Um, I would believe and I would push as um, the scientific representative for the species um, that it's the person's fault. Um, an attack like that does not imply that this is a chronic behavior by the mother. This was somebody doing something um, stupid, making a bad decision. Um, so I'm going to guess, and I can't say for sure, that um, Rocky would go uh, relatively um, unmolested by managers for that sort of activity. Um, and again, I think one of the incredible things that we've seen with all the public comments is the amount of, of leeway that the public gives a mom and a pup, right? So when, when you talk about that danger of a potential attack, so many of the comments are like, well, don't get near a mom. Of course that's what's going to happen. So, so I think the decision makers, I think the public know that if something happens, it's a human's fault, and she's just a protective mom. Agreed. Jeannie asks, does the pup need to learn buoyancy? I noticed she has a hard time staying below the surface like her mom. So, yeah. Um, so, uh, her, her, scientifically speaking, her fat to mass ratio is very skewed, and it's going to get even worse. So, um, she's going to be so blubbery by the time she weans, um, she won't be able to dive very deep, and it's going to take so much energy for her to do that. Um, she will likely not try to forage until um, she's uh, trimmed down a little bit and converted a lot of that blubber into muscle tissue. Um, so she's basically like a beach ball um, and will be for weeks after she weans. And it's going to get a lot worse than it gets now. I mean, you're not going to recognize her in a few weeks. What if you ask her something? She's three weeks old. That was tough. <laughs> Thank you. How hot can feels stand? How hot can it feel? Okay, the question that's a good one. Question is how hot can seals stand to be in? And so so there's there's two yeah, this is terrible. I'm sweating so much. Um, uh, there's two different things we have to consider. So it's the hotness on the outside and out in the ambient temperature in the air. Um, and then the temperature in the water. So we have to worry about heat and cold. Um, so they do amazingly well. We've watched animals that are hauled out all day. Um, and, oh, pup's making a break for it. Um, that are hauled out all day and completely content in the hottest of sun, and they seem to be okay. Um, but um, so they can handle 90 degree weather, 100 degree weather, and, and be okay. And it rarely ever gets that hot here. But for scientists, when we're trying to do our research or if we're going to intervene with an animal, um, that's kind of, they can handle really hot temperatures um, when they're just static and they're not doing anything. Um, but if it's, if it's the heat of the day, so if it's, you know, kind of later than 10 o'clock on a really sunny day um, or the animal's been hauled out for a really long time, even if it's a life-saving uh, intervention where we need to go capture that seal, we won't do it because while they can stand the heat, 
the added stress of trying to handle them in really hot temperatures can push them over the edge, and it's basically they go into capture stress, they, they, uh, capture stress, and they have a lot of heat problems, and they can die. Um, so it's one of the biggest things that we're worried about. It's they can handle the heat, but any additional stressors. Um, there have been studies um, with seals in captivity for monk seals about how much, what the temperature ranges that they can handle, and. They, they put the seal in the pool and they raise the temperature, you know, to like 60 degrees, 70 degrees, 80 degrees, 90 degrees, and the pup or the seal seemed totally content. They, they, pot, they didn't get so hot as to boil the water, but there didn't seem to be an upper range on how hot. But once it got down to a little under 60 degrees, it's a trained seal. They could not get it to go into the water. It physically refused. And once it got into the water, it would bark and it would moan. This is all great research that was done at Santa Cruz. Um, so it's more that there's a lower level of tolerance where they, like us, are just not going to get into cold weather. All of us folks in Hawaii have very, very low thermal tolerance for cold water. I have a question for you yeah. that I've seen in our chat. Um, so what is the number of Hawaiian monk seals currently? And what does the number need to be for them to not be endangered anymore? So currently we have about 300 monk seals in the main Hawaiian islands uh, and the 1,100 are in uh, the northwest Hawaiian islands. In terms of getting them to uh, a stable population, right now the population growth we believe is pretty stable. Um, in terms of where we want to be, Charles? So the, the recovery goals for monk seals are... Um, Oh, 3,400 animals um, with 2,900 in the northwest and 500 in the main Hawaiian Islands. So we're 200 short um, currently in the main Hawaiian Islands. And again, um, 200 more additional animals just for people doing the math or wondering what it looks like. You're not going to have a noticeable difference in sort of what the world of monk seals looks like down here. There's a whole lot of space left for monk seals. Um, but we are a long way away from doing that. So we have just recently stabilized the population and it's only been for a few years. So we should expect some good years and some bad years in the future. Um, but we are decades and decades and decades away from, from being anywhere near um, our recovery goals. I think um, one of the scientists who work for the Monk Seal Research Program has an amazing graphic which really drives the point home for me. Um, the Monk Seal population has had a lot of support um, from the community, from the scientists to help recover the species and right now they're like uh, uh, Monk Seals on a, on a train on the tracks up a very steep hill and we've got a lot of people holding that up and pushing them up and they're doing great but if we were to let go it might zoom right back down. Melody. So the question, wow, these are really good questions. I always think people are going to run out of them, but nope, there's more. And to that question, a lot of people are concerned because we're in King Tide yep. today. So uh, um, the question, the first part of the question is, if a tropical storm, uh, what's the one headed right now for Fernanda? Uh, um, uh, if there's a large storm like that, how, how do monk seals fare? Um, do they go into the water? Do they stay on land? Um, I think it's probably pretty variable. Um, uh, and, and to remind people, we've had really extreme events like the Japanese tsunami washed over a lot of the northwestern Hawaiian Islands, and we didn't really detect any notable change uh, for monk seals. So a lot of them were probably caught on shore and washed around and swirled. We might have lost a couple, but, but they're incredibly resilient. And of course, it's water, so they do fine. Um, You'll have a fair number that will probably go into the water. We do see some animals that seem to prefer to just be wet in the ocean if it's going to be raining um, rather than having it bothering them on land. Um, the second part of the question was with the king tides, does that do anything? Um, for a monk seal, they are totally oblivious to the king tide other than one monk seal on Maui that hauled out on a highway. Um, but uh, by and large, uh, they will be laying on the beach, and if the king tide comes up and they don't want to be have the water lapping, they'll either go into the water or they'll go up. But um, again, they're, they're so laid back, they'll just adapt. Great. How do you guys track the monk seals? Do you tag them with a chip? What kind of data are you collecting? Okay, the question is, how do we track monk seals? And do they have a chip? And, and what do we do with the data? It's a really, 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 really complex question. So we have um, uh, flipper tags on a lot of our seals. Um, so as soon as Kiivi, or I mean uh, Rocky's pup, weans, we will um, capture it really quickly. Um, we'll do a little health, health sampling to make sure everything is okay. 
and then we'll give some. Uh, we'll give her a pair of, of flipper tags, which will help us identify her through her lifetime, and that's one way we can track movements. Um, the other way we can track, if we're looking at foraging behavior, so what they're doing at, when they're at, out at sea, um, we can use satellite tags or sometimes cell phone tags. And so that gives us a map of everywhere they're going, where they're diving, what habitats are important for them, how deep they're diving, how long they're spending underwater. And that's where we get to these things about critical habitat and what's important for seals. Um, all of this data is used, um, we can also use video cameras and other things. All of this data is used to identify important places for monk seals, help us try to predict where the monk seal population is going to move to and where it's going to grow. Um, it helps us get good information out to fishermen and to other people that are worried about monk seals' impacts in the local environment. Are they eating all the fish? Are they eating in the same place that fishermen are fishing? Um, for us, we can also use it to model disease. So we look at how often animals are jumping from one island to the next through our sighting network or through our satellite tags and we can model disease and know if an outbreak occurs, what we need to do to stop it. So um, the data is used for a whole lot, um, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. Elizabeth asks, how far should people stay away from this? So we have a general rule. If you hold out your thumb like this and you can still see the monk seal, you're probably a little bit too close. Um, so just take a few steps back. Uh, traditionally, that's about 50 to 60 feet from an adult seal on the beach. If it's a mom and pup, we, we generally ask that you try and provide them um, maybe double that space just so that you're giving them the, the space that they need to, to bond and to nurse. And someone also asks, um, why are the boats so close? Why are the boats so Well, so those boats are actually moored right now. Um, so I think that they're, they're static. They were here first. <laughs> so, uh, I have another question. Um, is, does NOAA have any kind of enforcement capability as far as people who don't listen to the volunteers that are out here on a day-to-day -day basis to actually close a beach or uh, tell people to stay off the beach? Sure. So um, our responsibility okay. at... Oh, is an important one to repeat. Yes, okay. So the, the question was, does uh, NOAA have any um, enforcement ability to close down beaches or to keep people away from SEALs if they're not listening to the volunteers' suggestions? And uh, we do have an uh, Office of Law Enforcement, and generally they are going to be focused on if there is something that happens with the animal. So if someone actually does disturb an animal, uh, there are fines um, and prosecution can occur. If people are just getting too close and the animals are not disturbed, um, again, that distance is a guideline. In terms of closing down the beach, um, we do not have jurisdiction over closing down any beaches. Uh, we provide information on animal behavior and um, as much information as possible so that uh, other decision makers uh, from the Department of Land and Natural Resources uh, can, can use that information to determine how to best manage the scenario out here. But we're, we're really just responsible for making sure that um, people understand about the animals and that we're monitoring their health. Um, so, th and this is great to talk about. So the question was, what are we going to do with the pup when it comes time to tag her? And it's, it's good to prepare everybody for this because um, you, it is going to, for a few um, short minutes, um, quickly change from an idyllic, peaceful setting to a couple of researchers um, w restraining the seals. So um, basically, we'll, it'll take two people. We'll maybe have three. Um, the pup will be on the beach or in the very shallow water so that we can just encourage her up onto the shore. Um, one person will approach her from behind and just um, basically squat down gently on top of her and, and restrain the neck um, and basically use their bottom. They won't sit on the seal, but they'll use their bottom to restrain and their legs to keep the movement from going up and down or left and right. And then another person will come up behind and um, take each flipper and there's webbing in between each flipper, and so we pick one of the webs on each one. Um, there'll be a little hole punch um, that will take a little skin plug, which will help us with our genetic studies. Um, and then just slide these little flipper tags in, and then we will take a little bit of blood to be able to do kind of health screening on the pup, and that will be it. So uh, if we send our A-team, which we definitely will since we're doing it in such a public place, it will probably take a minute and a half or two minutes um, 
The B team will take two minutes to two and a half minutes. Um, Do we have a B team? There are no B teams. <laughs> Who officially named the park? So the community is definitely involved in naming the pup. Um, you know, Noah uses an alphanumeric uh, four-digit number name. It's the geek name. The geek name, thank you. Um, to be able to track each individual so we know who they are and um, can record them every time that we see them. Um, but in terms of the name like Rocky, um, that's definitely something that the community was involved in. Uh, the Hawaii Marine Animal Response is uh, the group of volunteers that you see out on the beaches. Um, they work with cultural practitioners and members of the community to help determine the name. Is it usually based on like where, like why is Rocky named Rocky? Do you know why Rocky is named Rocky? So Rocky, um, the grand old gal that she is, she's been around for quite a while, um, was uh, named back in the day when there was very few volunteers and it was named by a uh, volunteer uh, D.B. Dunlap which we just recently lost the original and only seal whisperer um, and he just saw her on the beach one day and there was a mark under her eye that was reminiscent of uh, uh, Rocky the raccoon and so decided to call her Rocky so back then it was a much less formal process in naming the seals um, now there are many many more, which is a good thing, but just more complicated, but many more invested parties in, in um, sort of uh, the connection and wanting to be involved in naming the seal. Uh, we have a question from the crowd. The, the audience. Here. This time, I lied the first time around. There actually is an audience now. <laughs> <laughs> you guys have fans, by the way. Um, so I think the question was, is, uh, uh, what was the in, the, in the time that you've been reporting and tracking, what was the height of the population of monk, Hawaiian monk seals? Okay, so the question was, what in all the time we've been working on them, and we haven't really had good numbers on monk seals for a long time, but what was the maximum population um, since the time that we were tracking it? Because we have no idea, historically, before man ever got here, how many monk seals there were. You have some estimates that were maybe it was only a few thousand or maybe 5,000, and others that are like 12,000 animals or maybe more. Um, those are all just kind of educated guesses. Um, one of the challenging things, and I'm not going to get too geeked out about population assessment here, but one of the challenges we have is that as time has gone on, our ability to um, uh, count the number of seals to get more accurate and, and to be more comprehensive has improved. So um, the highest number, I think, has been around that 1,250 to 1,300. The estimate now is 1,400. Um, so I think the thing to, to focus on is... Um, not so much the number and how accurate, I mean, the number is very accurate right now, but um, it is just focusing on that there's 1,400, which we know for sure is up compared to the bottom that we reached, um, and that it's been stable or increasing for the last few years. So um, I would say we're probably pretty close to um, the most seals um, in modern time. The one thing that's really different about it, though, is the distribution. So when it was that 1,200 or to 1,300 seals, those were all in the northwestern Hawaiian Islands, and there's virtually none down here. Now you've seen a really uh, dramatic shift in those numbers um, with uh, 1,100, so still a significant drop to what used to be in the northwest, but um, quite a very, very dramatic rise in the number of animals in the main Hawaiian Islands. Um, when it, it's, to go back to the, uh, what is the relationship between NOAA and the Hawaii Marine, now called Hawaii Marine Animal Response? What's the relationship between the two? Sure, so NOAA uh, provides a grant Question. to... Thank you. <laughs> I hope no one out there thinks that rude. <laughs> Everyone complain that we never repeat the question. Charles is very rude. Don't let him fool that you. That is true. <laughs> Um, so the question was, what relationship does NOAA have with the volunteer network, the Hawaii Marine Animal Response Group? Uh, so NOAA provides a grant to the nonprofit Hawaii, Hawaii Marine Animal Response to essentially provide outreach on the beach, uh, set up the seal resting areas around the animals to help prevent takes, um, and provide information uh, about the seals that they're, that they're finding on the beach. They're kind of our first line to what is happening. Um, they also... Uh, definitely help us out when we've got an injured seal or um, a hooked seal that we're looking for. They, they put a lot of hours doing hikes um, out at Kaena Point and other locations to help us locate seals and then monitor them after they've been released um, and rehabilitated.
or did they answer how do you decide if you're going to tag them with the flipper tag or one where you can track with a satellite? So uh, the question was, how do we decide between the flipper tags or with the satellite tag? Um, so every seal um, is going to, as best we can, is going to get flipper tags because that it's just this fundamental part of our program. And and I guess one thing I want to jump in here because when you watch it, it is going to be uh, invasive. Um, it is you know physically handling and interacting with the seal. But I think one of the things we need to drive home is um, collectively with all of our partners, volunteers, state, federal agencies. This is the most. Um, uh, proactive applied marine mammal recovery program on the planet, right? We're doing amazing things and we're making a difference for the population and it's driven by the quality of our science and the number one thing um, that supports all of our efforts is how well we know the population. So if, if there wasn't a real return on the investment of flipper tagging an animal, being able to follow it through its life and then ex and, and multiplying that across the entire population, knowing literally the life of all these animals, we wouldn't be able to do the things that we do. So. Um, we would be much more hands off if we didn't think that it was worthwhile. So getting back to the original question, so every seal will get flipper tags um, and when they lose them, uh, quite often we will grab them again, six, seven, eight, nine, maybe even 20 years down the line um, to give them tags again. Um, but we only put satellite tags on animals if they're going to be part of a study on, on where they're going and, and what they're eating or if they're an animal of interest. Say we have, uh, for instance, a seal that was on Kauai that was going into a canal uh, feeding on fish scraps and was in danger of getting sick or drowning in, in, in lay nets. Um, we picked that seal up and we satellite tagged it and then we moved it to a different place on the island. So that satellite tag helps us know where it's moving to and when it's gonna get back, if, you know, if it did, which it ended up doing, go back to the place we'd removed it from. And then the third category, is if an animal has come in for an intervention, like all the seals we bring from the Northwest Hawaiian Islands and fatten up at the Monk Seal Hospital and then release again, um, those animals will get a satellite tag so we can monitor them post-release when they're thousands of miles away to make sure that they're surviving that initial release and, and doing what they're supposed to be doing. Yesterday I met a gentleman who had a badge on him that said Noah mm -hmm. and he had a gun on him. Yeah. Can you describe the difference between that gentleman and you? I want to tackle this one, Please do. just because this is really important. So the question was, uh, uh, someone, you're not from the audience, one of our f reporters, um, Anthony, uh, ran into a man with a badge and a gun um, that said Noah, and so he wanted to know the difference between us as Noah agents and then the real Noah agent. Um, we don't want him to have We don't agent. want, I'm, I'm technically not allowed to have one. Um, but, um, this is so important because, because people often ask us why we as a manager or a scientist don't, don't do more. We have no enforcement capability. All we do is give information and guidance, but we, um, you can ignore us uh, as much as you want. Um, and we will have to, if you want to approach that seal and touch it, then you go and, and touch that seal. If I was NOAA Office of Law Enforcement, or we often call them NOAA OLE or OLE, um, they tell you not to approach, or uh, they won't tell you not to approach that seal. They they probably advise you that it's it's a poor choice, um, but you will have to deal with them afterwards if you do it in front of them. So that's the big distinction. They've got authority and power legally. We just have good advice. And if you don't do it in front of them, um, as we have learned in the past, everyone has cell phone cameras on them, and uh, OLE will likely get a picture of you doing it. Yeah. The... The, the, the watchful eyes are everywhere. We hear about everything. One more question in the back. So historically, what, are the, what, was, what is the probability of getting Rocky and the folks to move from Kaimana to here? I thought that they kind of stayed where they were born. The, 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 the question was, what was the probability of... of um, Rocky, who was um, uh, 150 feet away where, where she had her pup and now is just right here um, uh, with the expectation that moms and pups stay in the, the same place. So this for a monk seal and a mom and a pup is, is a trivial, is a relatively trivial distance. So in our minds, um, this is the same birthplace. Um, they could move all the way down, um, halfway down Waikiki, and we could still consider that be a little bit extreme, but still relatively reasonable. What we don't expect is massive geographic changes, like swimming together between islands. It would even be a big, uh, a 
pretty significant jaunt from, say, the pup that was with her mom on the Mokalea Islands, or the Moks, um, not Mokalea, um, Mokalua, uh, and then swimming over to Kailua. That's probably, um, you're not going to see that very often. But along the shoreline, it, it, it can be half a mile, it can be a mile. Um, it's not going to be much more than that, but this is nothing. Um, to, to, do you mind if I, um, please. do you, okay, so please do. I just, a lot of comments are I talk too much and you should talk more, so, um, no. so, uh, just two quick questions, um, the one, first one was, what are the odds that Rocky's pup is going to venture off to the northwestern Hawaiian Islands, uh, when she gets older, it's a definite possibility, it's, it's relatively small, we do see a little bit of exchange between the main islands and the northwestern Hawaiian Islands and vice versa, um, we know that about 10% of all animals travel to at least one other location or one other subpopulation by the time um, they are an adult. Um, but quite often they stay pretty, they show a high degree of fidelity or loyalty to, to the island that they were born and raised on. Um, I have no doubt that sometime in her life she's probably going to swim to one of the other main Hawaiian islands. Um, but it's, it's, it's significantly less probable she'll go to the northwest. But it's not unheard of. What's the farthest distance you know that an animal has traveled? Um, the farthest distance we know that an animal has traveled, um, we have a seal that was born on Midway that island hopped all the way down to South Point um, on the Big Island. But in, total of, in, in terms of total distance on a single trip, we tracked one seal, um, Kermit, uh, with a satellite tag. And uh, we instrumented him on White Plains Beach on Oahu swam out for some reason. Uh, monk seals tend to stay pretty shallow. They don't go much deeper than 500 meters, so about 1,800 feet, um, and 1,600 feet. Um, but swam out to the middle of the ocean, was out for 30 days, and then came back to the same spot on the beach. Um, the total distance would have brought him from Oahu to San Francisco and partway back. Um, so they have the ability to go extremely far. So again, swim between islands is, is nothing. Um, one last question that was asked was, what will they eat? Yep. Monk seals have a, a really quite generalist diet. They tend to focus on things that are on or near the bottom of the ocean. So they don't like to chase things in the water column. So they're not going to go after a lua like these big jacks or, or tuna or any of these things. Um, it will be uh, focusing on octopus, uh, some reef fish, uh, some flat fish, um, some crustaceans and lobster. But it's mostly things that try to hide when a monk seal is coming after them. So if, if you're a fish or an octopus and you try to go under a rock or in a hole in a coral reef, a monk seal will probably eat you. If you shoot off into the water column, they will probably uh, give up and, and look for something else. And so one last question. Oh, the new seal right behind us is Kaivi. So she's a six-year-old female that just finished molting, which is why her coat is so gorgeously silver um, and uh, and Rocky, no offense to the Rocky lovers out there, looks a little natty. Um, is that the one that she attacked? Yeah. Okay. So today, how come she let her The question is, uh, we talked about this a little bit earlier, why, why if she's attacked her, if Rocky's attacked Kiwi previously, she's not attacking her now. She's just being tolerant. Any moment, she could just turn around and start going after her. And if, I'm guessing if Kiwi or if Kiwi had started moving toward the water right now, you would have some vocalizations and some interaction. Okay, we're calling it a day. I have just a few things that I wanted to mention. Um, so we've talked a lot about warnings, and I, I think that some people are heeding them, and we just really want to thank, thank folks for, for keeping themselves safe um, and sharing the information with their friends. Um, I really want to thank the Hawaii Marine Animal Response uh, team. They have spent so many hours here trying to educate the public um, and, and teach people all about monk seals. Uh, I know that it's been a really stressful time for a lot of them because it, it's, it's pretty scary when you're seeing folks in the water and you know what could happen. Um, so I just I, I want to thank them from the bottom of all of our hearts for, for keeping on at it. Um, and I know that they're, they're pretty dispersed all over the island right now with our other pup that we've got on the North Shore um, and the other one out at the Moak. So thank you. A few of them are here right now. I also want to thank Ocean Safety, who's been working hard to provide warnings to the public as well. 
Um, and as you can see here at the outrigger, uh, essentially the whole beach is cordoned off for these seals. So um, I do know the outrigger has provided a lot of information to their guests um, and, and they're trying to warn people as well. And, and they're being incredibly respectful for the seals. Uh, I know they changed part of the, their event on uh, last Saturday to keep people safe as well. So they're doing a lot of work and we really appreciate it. And the only place you can come and dine with a view of a mom and a pop. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Uh, well, thanks, everyone. We will see you in a week. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Aloha. Okay. Did you want to